here today. Uh, a little preamble to that introduction, one, of, one reason I'm here is about 2000, 2003, the environmental community in Oregon started to say, my God, we're heating the water. Actually, it's California as well. We're heating the water from the, the turbidity is, is heating the water. It's already critical temperatures of the California rivers. The fish are being sucked up through the pumps and we're grinding on up, up, up and spitting the guts and blood out the back of our of our sluice boxes and I had one of those really big two and a half inch dredges that floats on an inner tube and I thought, geez, the kids and I really enjoyed going out with this, are we going to be able to do this anymore? Because I'm an environmentalist, let's face it, that's why I made my money. <clears throat> Well, fortunate for me as a research biologist, I have all of these resources to go out. If I was to, to write a hypothesis and start a research project, I have to go out and find out what has already been done. Uh, perhaps what I had in my hypothesis uh, is already done, or I'm interested in some other part of it. So you go back and you, you research all this information. Well, that's what I did with, with dredging. And I thought, this is bull. These people are nuts. So I'm going to take my data I got to get everything I can, and I got to share it with them. I made CDs. I went to American Fishery Society's journals and many, many other society journals, and took out those scientific publications. I copied them out. I had CDs with hundreds of research papers on it, and I presented these. They couldn't care less. But that's why. I'm here today, and why you're probably not having a bunch of other scientists step up to help you, is I am, and I was at that time, a suction dredger. So I've gone from a two and a half inch suction dredge in about 2003 to a five inch today. And when we had our trip to Cambodia, we were operating six inch dredges. So that's the largest I've ever done. So, why are we under attack? Find my button here. Start with, we want a definition. Significant effect on the environment means a substantial adverse change in the environment, and we are not getting this from the typical small-scale gold suction dredges that we operate. Where science is accurate on the potential harm that we're causing to the environment is when they talk about if we suck up sensitive life stages. If you run eggs through your dredge, if you don't damage the eggs, the fish downstream are going to eat them, or whatever is predatory. Same with the sack fry. They're even more delicate than the eggs, because the eggs at a certain point will harden off, and it's much more difficult to harm them. But those sack fry, you run those through that turbidity, those sacks are going to be ripped off. I want you to notice, as I go through my presentation, if I'm citing a scientific publication, you will see the citation right down here. That's just the scientist in me. But I, I don't have any science of my own to present to you. This is science from the whole realm of science that's already out there published by individuals or organizations. Turbidity. Big issue. They're trying to shut us down because of the turbidity. Now, turbidity is not a pollutant. Turbidity is materials in solution that prevent the transmission of light. This photograph here was taken at flood states on the Klamath River in 2006 by Jim Foley. And at that time, Jim also went down and he collected us a sample of that water and shipped it to us. And at that time, my associate, Claudia Wise, was still working for EPA. I think I probably would have retired at that time. So we had a turbidity meter available so we could do some testing and find out what the result on this is. And we have, uh, we do, when you're going to run a sample, you mix it up really good to get everything in suspension. And then she took her samples for analysis. And we have these small vials, so I dispensed it in that and let them set overnight in a window for 24 hours. And I thought, well, this is cool. This is what that water there looks like in a bottle and this is what it looked like after it set for 24 hours and there's your turbidity right there and this is it after we shook it up now that turbidity has a 
methylometric turbidity unit value of 656. These NTUs is the term that we use to describe the intensity of the turbidity. We actually have three studies that were performed and where they had turbidity measurements downstream of the dredges. And the most important thing to look here is the maximum turbidity. Here we got 20.5 NTU values, 13 feet downstream in Canyon Creek, California. Here in Butte Creek, California, we had a 50 NTU value as a value as a maximum. And down here in the Alaska study, 40 Mile River, we had 19 NTU. So the maximum number you're going to see there is 50. So those are just numbers. Let's try them. See if we can make those numbers make some sense to us. Here's 57 NTU. In this study, they did a dose response test. They kept, they had fish in closed containers that were exposed to these values of turbidity 24 hours a day. And if they are captured in there for 24 hours a day at 57 NTU, in six days it could cause you to die. A fish, in this case, these were sensitive juvenile salmonids. First of all, I don't know any of you that are dredging at night. Typically, according to the California EIR, we typically dredge four to six hours a day. And even if you have multiple dredgers on the river, you might have eight, nine, ten hours maximum during the longest days of the summer. You're never going to have 24 hours. And, except in the smallest streams, the turbidity never covers the full width of the stream. So the fish have a choice whether they'd like to swim in or out of those turbidity plumes. I like, particularly like this illustration because it was taken by Craig Tucker of the Karuk tribe. It, it, he wanted to use this to show how bad turbidity was, but the beauty of this picture is right here in that photograph, the turbidity plume is already be, beginning to disappear. It's just a very few feet downstream from that dredge. And I'm looking at and estimating that's probably at least a six inch dredge. Then on the other hand, what can the federal government do with turbidity? They took two-thirds of the Glenis Canyon Dam out of the Elwha River. This is up in the Olympia National Forest. And they ran this kind of turbidity down the river. They unleashed 34 million cubic yards of sediment, enough to fill three million truckloads. But they're hoping the fish will come back in the future. Well, I believe they will. And what's going to happen is the majority of the spawning is not in that main stem. The majority is probably, I say probably, in the tributaries. Uh, so they'll, they'll wipe out for a few years all of the stream bed here in the main stem. It'll take a few years to flush that out. But one thing that's fortunate, that th those fish that come back, they may, they have what they call stray. And they may stray. Those that would normally spawn in the main Elwha River may stray into those side streams and their young may come back later on and populate the main river after a few years once all this is cleaned out. But if it works for this kind of a situation, there, there's no scientific justification, justification they could ever say that that little bitty plume behind the suction bed is a terrible environmental hazard or harm. Now this is a picture by Tom Kitcher. And in this picture, we see the Grants Pass, Oregon sewage treatment plant, and he drew in what he thought was a reasonable, now, uh, accurate size of a four-inch dredge, just for comparison. The sewage treatment plant requires a National Pollution Discharge Elimination uh, System permit, which is under Clean Water Act, uh, Act Section 402. Well, the state of the EPA and in Oregon, the Department of Environmental Quality, they're claiming that suction dredges also need an NPDES permit. This is a big fight that's going on in Idaho right now, which is a new battle. 
The addition of a pollutant into a water system is key to whether EPA and state environmental protection agencies have regulatory jurisdiction over specific mining activities. You can see the picture on the bottom is pretty obvious. A pipe dumping something into a receiving water is different than a picture on the, that was left on the right where you have a suction dredge is merely mixing what's already in there. Suction dredging within a normal high water mark of a river channel add, adds nothing. So it cannot pollute. Because the miners and prospectors are in the river channel, they can't add anything that isn't already there. Now I think probably all of you have heard of this U.S. Supreme Court case with uh, Chief Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. It's just so obvious that they, that she concluded turbidity is not a pollutant added to a waterway. And her description is if you take a ladle and remove a ladle of soup out of a pot and dump it back in, you haven't added anything to it. On the other hand, there's a federal agency that's loading a river with gravel for salt and salmon spawning. Now, I actually support this, but it's a hypocrisy of what I'm talking about here. Uh, four inch, typical four-inch dredge, I don't know how many days it would take to move just the amount of material in that, in that scoop in the front of that loader, especially if it's not all sized where it just goes through like a sand or pea gravel, you know, where we're actually throwing the boulders aside and everything. So this is what we have to deal with, this hypocrisy that state and federal agencies will do these things, and then another foot enforcement agency will come along behind it and say these things that, that we're using are, are causing harm to the environment. It's just nonsense. Now back when we were fighting for that new EIR, there was this organization here, just one of many, environmental organizations that had information on the internet. <clears throat> and I highlighted here that they said that holes in the river bottom damage scarce fish habitat. And so I'm always interested in that. Well, these fish didn't mind it, but you know, they're just, they're, they're just resting in that large hole. But it's just one of the most beautiful uh, pictures that I saw. However, I came across this study, and this is a real beauty. This is, as you can see along the bottom here, Leroy Sire, fish biologist for the Sixth River National Forest. And what he did, this is the Salmon River, California, this confluent of the Klamath River. What he did is he, this one year, got enough money and support from his management. They went out with a the crew. They measured after, this, after the end of mining season, they went out and they measured the depth, length, and width of every dredge hole they found. They found 53 jet dredge holes. You can see here where we have some of the tailings back there, and then there's the dip there. Whoops, well, I did it. Anyhow, there was a big, deep hole there, and we can see a couple of fish in it. We call that refugia. Refugia are not just located at the mouths of streams, as the environmentalists in California Fish and Game and others would like you to believe. Refugia are any depression in the river bottom greater than three feet where the fish can get down under and out of the current. Anyhow, they found, we found 53 sites and those sites on a linear basis, because we don't, cannot calculate area because of the variant width and depth of the river, so we can only get, do it on a linear basis. Do close to the mic. Thank you. How's that? Better, okay? No. no. It's the radio guys that are... Okay. Yeah, that's good right there. Right there? Perfect. So, those holes impacted only 1,066 linear feet of river bottom. And I asked a local, well, how long is the river? He's about 79 miles. So that river has a length of 417,120 linear feet. So the su suction dredges disturb less than 0.26% of that river bottom. And this is a definition I just gave you. Anything deeper than three feet in the river bottom is considered a refugia, a potential refugia. 
The study identified 27 of 53 jet dredge holes, or 51%, that had the potential of improving habitat for the survival of fish. Because refuge is not just a resting area. The, the slide that I went by too fast had three pictures of, of fish eating birds. <clears throat> and so, if the fish are deeper in the water, those fish are going to have a more difficult time, or the birds are going to have a more difficult time capturing those fish. So, depth is protective, as well as the potential that they can run into some cooler waters and get down in there. Now, again, in the Environmental Protection Information Center stated that expert hydrologists and fish wildlife biologists have consistently testified suction dread mining destroys the clear cold waters. And that, I was kind of curious what these people were saying, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in his court declaration, Dr. Peter Moyle stated it should be assumed <laughs> there is harm, unless it can be proven otherwise. So guilty and until proven innocent. <laughs> One reason for my taking this conservative position is that we simply do not know the effects of dredging on many species. He goes on to say, even for Salmon, it's information on the effects of dredging or in non-peer-reviewed reports. So now I'm curious, what did Harvey have to say? <laughs> effects of dredging commonly appear to be minor and local, but natural resource professionals should expect effects to vary widely among stream systems and reaches. And I like this guy's science, but he really annoys me because He's, he's, he's outside of his bounds of science. He, he goes, gets into discussion and he begin, he's, talking, he's talking policy. Scientists don't have the right to talk policy. Scientists bring science to the politicians, to those people, and present it to them. And those elected officials are the people responsible for policy. So he went on and said, given the current level of uncertainty about the effects of dredging where threatened or endangered aquatic species inhabit dredged areas, fisheries managers would be prudent to suspect that dredging is harmful to aquatic resources. Again, here's just a picture. Now, this is pretty common. It's been out there. You see this nice perch downstream next to a dredge. You can see, uh, this is really nice, you can see the dredge material coming off the back of this loose box. He's not disturbed at all. All of you that have been in the waters, you've seen this. But whether it's these centrarchids or whether it's a salmonid. <clears throat> Here we have some deep water salmonids. You can see the materials falling in there and they're just, just feasting. McDonald's. Absolutely. Effective scale is very important. I've already given you an example of that with that Salmon River study. Here's a, an example of two <coughs> holes being dredged in the river here. Four inch dredge left, five inch dredge to the right. Claudia Wise left to the dredge to the left, Joe Green dredge to the right. <laughs> But when you look at this, we went down the bridge and took a picture. You could barely see her green pontoons there and my camouflage ones are right here. And you see nothing. An even better example of effective scale is this one here. You see nothing except these two yellow pontoons right there. You know, so the, the concerns, yeah, we gather. Especially if you have a club eight or, so, or something, there's gatherings down there for a few weeks, weeks or two. But as a rule, you all know that suction dredging is self-limiting in the sense that if you're dredging upstream or downstream from a suction dredge, putting out turbidity, you're blind. Whether, you know, it's always temporarily in and out, but that's not a good, safe situation for you dredging around those large boulders and the like. So, spectra scale, Salmon River, less than 0.26%. The Oregon Water uh, Enhancement Board, Watershed Enhancement Board, had some information with the river miles of the state of Oregon. And we know there's about 2,000 suction dredge miners because of the permits that they purchased. And we did calculations on what their impact might be, and it was less than 0.0064% of all Oregon waterways. 
who did the same thing with Idaho, where they only had, before EPA came in, the year before EPA came in, they had 915 miners that purchased permits. And by this calculation, they might impact 13 miles of Idaho's 193,000 river miles. 0.0067% of all Idaho river miles. This, oh, Western Mining Alliance, this is a, of course an exceptional garbage dump site. I'm told all of this waste was taken off of one claim during one season in the American River. And if you look at that material that's on there, <coughs> you're going to see, well, the beer cans could be miners. But the oars are probably not. The golf balls are not. Uh, there's just many things on here, water bottles, and, and especially all the sunglasses, and those little kind of like a baseball hat that just has the rim and doesn't have, have you know, that the rafters like to wear. Basically, we're looking at hundreds of pounds of, of uh, rafting waste that's just being washed or dropped overboard probably when they come through some of the white water and then it gets washed down into, into the slow, calm areas. Small-scale mining does have beneficial effects. It improves water quality by removing, <laughs> by removing massive amounts of lead weight. I use water bottles, car debris, nails, bolts, that's all that you've seen in a previous photograph. Survival is improved under tur turbid conditions. That's where I explained that the fish, the smaller fish that are being preyed on can move in and out of that cloud of material and uh, get away from the larger predators. The holes in, in depression deeper than three feet or create safe fish habitat. The bread, this is interesting. The dredging breaks up compacted, compacted embedded stream beds. We're fine, especially up on a Klamath, but you know, how's up there? four or five years ago, they had 17 forest fires going. And what happens after the forest fires is rain comes. And then the, the, the soils and sediments are washed into the rivers. And they, they say what's happening is the rivers are actually being aggraded. They're actually being built up from all these materials being washed in. Problem with that, all those fine materials are also cementing it. I, I've been in areas when I, if I take my five inch nozzle and put it against the gravel when I'm just starting, it's not moving. You take a bar and start breaking out a few of those rocks and then you get it started, it'll come apart. Well, if I can't open that up with a five inch dredge, what's the salmon going to do just wiggling in its tail? Mm -hmm. That's potentially very good spawning gravel of, a, of an appropriate size, but that salmon's not going to be able to open up that material so that they can deposit their eggs. Tailings may compose a portion of the suitable spotting grounds each year. There was a study that came out that concerned me, and it was Harvey and Lyle again, and they said that salmon would come in and they would spawn on some of these tailings, and the tailings would be washed out with the reds during the high waters. That was the first study, other than the sensitive life stage work, that concerned me. But as you read through the paper, the statement said that the reds were also being washed out of the normal substrate. And if salmon come in and they don't have, you know, they're not dumb, they're, they're, they're amazing the animals, but they know that they can't make a red. And so what they'll do is they'll move down to some gravel material that they can move, and in this case they would go to a dredge tailing. So if you didn't have those dredge tailings, the salmon would go in and spawn on normal river bottom and maybe have salmon there that has spawned but if there's uh, inadequate material what will happen is another salmon will come along behind them and they could actually wash out and kill the original red that was placed earlier by a fish so i mean it's just not there's so many great areas in there there's pluses and minuses And lastly on this list, dredge tailings protect established reds by offering additional spawning substrate, which is what I just said. <coughs> this, this here should be the final answer right here. We have six environmental impact statements, the earliest 1992, 
and we have one biological evaluation 2012 Environmental Protection Agency. So here, every one of these environmental impact reports published have the exact same conclusion. The, the effects of small scale suction dredging on the environment is less than significant. The first EIR that I could find was published in 1992 in the Chugach National Forest in Alaska. That was followed by the one we all know here, the original 1994 environmental impact report. Again, we have one that came out at Siskiyou County, or Siskiyou National Forest, Oregon, Clearwater National Forest, Idaho, Wallava Whitman National Forest, Oregon, down here, the $1.5 million 2012 California Environmental Impact Report. And this is a biological evaluation that EPA just came out with so they can use that to try to force a Clean Water Act and PDS permit on the suction dredgers of Idaho. That, inform that information there alone should stop any state or federal organ organization from moving forward against suction dredging. It's just like it's not there. So, small scale gold suction dredging affects a very small area in the environment relative to the entire area in which all dredges operate. Operation of these dredges has an impact on the environment that's less than significant. So, is it environmental concern that's driving mining out of the United States or rather politics on the grand scale? And this is really important because I think some of the fights that we're having are we're probably having the wrong fights or we're just looking at science because they don't care. And if it's a political issue, taking science to the politicians isn't going to create any solutions. How many in this room know what a United Nations Agenda 21 is? Can I see a show of hands? One, two. This is a good room. That's about half. Normally, I can have a room of 30, 40 people and get five or six hands. Wow. The current administration has designed millions of acres of federal land off limits to multiple use, such as mining, and seems to be attempting to look at public to lock up public land, all without consulting Congress or the public. You know, we've already heard about that today. The administration seems to be conforming U.S. environmental policy to United Nations strategies. Critics of the administration's land grab point to the United Nations. Yes. They accuse the president of implementing the United Nations Agenda 21 and the Convention on Biological Diversity introduced, introduced during the 1992 Earth Summit. Agenda 21 initially was soft or passive law, unsigned by the Senate of the United States. In 1995, President Bill Clinton signed an executive order that created the President's Council on Sustainable Development. This duplicitous action was to harmonize U.S. environmental policy with United Nations directives as outlined in Agenda 21. The executive order directed all of the federal government to work with state and local community government in a joint effort to reinvent government using the guidelines outlined in Agenda 21. The single step, unseen or heard by citizens, radically changed the federal agency's actions toward oppression of citizens of the United States. Some of what Shannon told us earlier starting to make sense, isn't it? Yes. The way their arrogance, and the way they treat the citizens of the owners of the public domain when they're out there. The United Nations Agenda 21 is a 40 chapter, 381 page book focused on organizing society around sustainable use and development of the planet. It's based on socialist principles of equal sharing of all natural resources. Now, that, that statement's kind of silly, isn't it? Equal sharing, but they're, they're not willing to share it to us. So there's a little bit of a disconnect at that point, I see. 
Agenda 21 sets a goal to control all human activity to protect Earth's ecosystems and biological diversity. So actually, according to this type of a logic, all of us in this room are vermin. On, on the, you see how these biological triangles, you know, of life. Mm -hmm. Well, you would think because of our successes and growth and things that we do, we'd be at the top. We'll have a food chain, and it literally, literally, <laughs> literally, we are. But what's happening is that the environmentalists are trying to flip that triangle. Sorry, Nancy, is this disco? <laughs> it's a light show. That last one wasn't me, Joe. <laughs> I'll go a different color. I really like this man's work. He wrote an article, this uh, Tom McDonald article titled Tech That's perfect. That's fine. Technical Review of the Wildlands Project and How It Is Affecting the Management of State, Federal, and Private Lands in the United States. And he said that during the past several years, resource industries, state and local governments, and communities nationwide have been buried under an avalanche of new species listings, appeals and litigation to stop water development, or can't water... Can't hear you, Joe. What? Can't hear you back here. Now you can't hear me. There we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, logging, mining, grazing, and recreational activities. There have been vast amounts of legislation proposed proposing new wilderness areas, heritage areas, scenic rivers, biological corridors, state and national parks, or wildlife refuges, as well as management plans involving critical habitat, watersheds, or ecosystems. While many of these actions seem to be isolated incidents, a review of wildlands project documents suggests that the actions are often well-coordinated activities aimed, according to the project text, and establishing a regional reserve system which will ultimately tie the Northwest continent into a single biological diverse, or biodiversity reserve. For those of you that have never seen the map, if you look there at the top, simulated wildlands project as required by the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. So what you read down here, a simulated map of wildlands projects showing land designated off limits to all human activity. If this goes through, those places on the map, no humans will be allowed in there. The other 21, I never heard of it. And I started reading through that and I thought, oh my God. I wasted my time for all the years. The fight's not about science. It's about World government, control over humanity, denying us, denying us our, in the United States, our civil rights, denying us access to our own public lands. It just, it's just mind-boggling. Here's an example of this Reed Ross out of the University of Oregon. Describe what's needed to save the <coughs> viability of the grizzly bear and what he wants. If the population of grizzlies in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is to be connected to other populations, which seems to be necessary to assure population viability, then wide corridors at least 27 and a half miles wide must be connected to Yellowstone with the wildlands of central Idaho, which is about 200 miles away. <laughs> Road closures would be required to make interregional corridors safe because road densities of about a half mile of road per square mile of habitat may be a threat to the grizzly. Yeah, that's a laugh. Yeah. How many of you guys are afraid of a grizzly? <laughs> yeah. The mission was articulated by the White House science and technology czar, John Holdren, who said a massive campaign must be launched to restore a high quality environment in North America and to de-develop the United States. De-develop. They want us, they want to tear down the, the last 150 years of what we've built. Not good for the birds and the beasts and the mammals. Or the man. Right. 
Significant additions to the timetable was provided by President Barack Obama. Consider the executive memorandum quietly issued April 16, 2010, deceptively titled, America's Great Outdoor Initiative. The stated goal of the initiative, reconnect the American, America's rivers, waterways, landscapes and nation, of national significance, ranches, farms and forests, great parks, and coasts and beaches by creating corridors of connectivity across these outdoor spaces. In presenting his unilateral order, Obama sealed a deal on what promoters of the green agenda have desired for decades, reconnect the lands of North America, creating several sweeping corridors designed to provide seamless connectivity between millions of acres of outdoor spaces. Notice ranches, farms, and forests, and coasts and beaches in the reconnection goal. This means that private ownership of such property is in the crosshairs of this scheme. The initiative will be advanced by the federal government. You're seeing that happening. Working through private and public partnerships that locally support conservation strategies. The simple phase empowered environmental organizations and their deep pocket donors to have a seat at the table with policymakers at all levels of miners somehow joined in that case because they knew that the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality wasn't going to do anything to protect miners' rights. And the courts accepted them. So now we have three people or three groups in this court case. Well, what happened? Unbeknownst to the miners, the NEDC and the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality had a little sit down behind the scenes, came up, wrote a multi page contract giving the environmentalists every right that they never had under the law. They were not stakeholders, and that's what initiated this agreement because the miners came in here and said, You don't have anything to say about it, environmentalists. You're not, <coughs> you're not stakeholders. <coughs> so what happened? The Oregon Department of Environmental Quality through the Sioux and Settle made sure that they were stakeholders. It's just dirty. All paid for by our tax dollars. Yes. Oh yes, it's our money. But it's not it's not spent fairly and equally, you know. Here the U.S. Chamber of Commerce report that Sue and Settle scam was responsible for many of EPA's most controversial economically significant regulations that have plagued the business community for the past few years. The study found that among the regulations imposed on the American people using the strategy were restrictions on power plants, refineries, mining operations, cement plants, chemical firms, and numerous other industries and sectors. And here's some news articles. It's from the LA Times. Federal plan aims to help wildlife adapt to climate change. One key proposal is to create wildlife corridors that would let animals and plants move to new habitats. You know, some of this that I'm saying, if you're not attuned to it, is so, but so bizarre, you, you know, as, as an American citizen, that it's hard, to, you know, conspiracy theory. And it's hard to believe if you don't want to open your eyes and look into this. And that's why I went to the newspapers and, and various press to get some titles and statements here to show you what I described earlier, here it is happening, and they're reporting it in the news. A draw on a line in the paper, pick and shovel GBAA, the National Parks Conservation Association, Morongo Basin Conservation Association, and 29 Palms Tourist Bureau testified. Annexation of the Virginia Dale Gold Park Mining District into the Joshua Tree National Park would protect animal corridors. Kill the Cowboys, the plan to rewild the West. Radical Green cite the worst examples of a few irresponsible ranchers in order to win public support for the rewilding agenda, which calls for the dismantling of our agricultural base and wholesale rewilding of the earth. And that's where they eat. wolves come in. We don't need wolves. We've got plenty of wolves in, in, uh, in Canada, Alaska. They bring them in because wolves killed the calves and the lambs. If you could kill the calves and the lambs, you under, undercut the, the financial potential of the, 
the farmers to survive. And if you haven't heard, they're now concerned they're bringing grizzlies into the cascades of the state of Washington. Hey. The Obama administration looking to set aside millions of acres for habitat preservation. A sweeping new Obama administration strategy to protect plants, fish, and animals from the hazards of global warming would require the government to set aside millions of acres of land to preserve threatened habitat. Global warming is a fraud. Global warming, there's plenty of science showing that the science that you're getting reported is fraudulent. Social engineering and behavior modification are some of the true objectives being implemented under the guise of environmental and climate protection. This is accomplished by exploiting people's desire to maintain a healthy and lasting environment in the name of sustainability. That's a dirty word. That's a United Nations word, and every time you read it, you want to double read that article and see what someone's up to. A lot of people, well-meaning, use that word and do things that are, you know, in the community it's okay. But any time you see that article, you need to examine that article and see the, exactly what's going on. That's a term out of the United Nations. The concept of sustainability is a call for government policies that demand changes in human behavior and lifestyle under penalty of law. On its own, sustainability is one of those slogans that sounds typically benign, but like most left-oriented expressions, there's a sinister translation. United Nations Agenda 21 calls for worldwide population control and suggests moving people from rural areas to the cities so sustainable development can be more easily managed. One of the United Nations objectives is to reduce the world population, human population, by up to two-thirds of what it was in 1992. Since the inception of the environmental movement, its leaders have been consumed with eliminating capitalism and ushering in a global area of socialism. Their call for being green goes far beyond demanding clean air, pure water, healthy forests, and alternative sources of energy. The leftists at the helm of the environmentalist hierarchy want to control the air, the water, the forests, and the natural resources. The environmental agenda has been infected by extremism. It has become an economic suicide pact. You must understand the Green Agenda is not about celebrating the beauty of our planet. It is an assault on mankind. It's an agenda that has no regard for your needs, lifestyle, dreams, desires, or feelings. UN Agenda 20 was so insidious that people do not connect the top, the dots between. All right. It is not working. They're not going to tell us about the dots, are they? Got it. So they're not, they're not connecting the dots between global warmists and the climate change industry. Extreme environmentalists. Property rights battles with non-governmental organizations around the country. Mainstream media. Publishers of textbooks and other publications. Common Core Education Standards, International Baccalaureate Schools, Land Conservation, Conservation Easements, Regionalism, Living in Tiny Homes and Tiny Spaces, Rewilding of America, 
removing Americans from their cars into public transportations or bikes, taking roads out of commission, sustainable development, smart meters, destroying suburbia, smart grids, and the green agenda with wind and solar power. United Nations at 21, Agenda 21, is a carefully disguised attempt to hijack the worthy cause of environmentalism in a pursuit of political objectives. And I do want to emphasize this part right here, the worthy cause of environmentalism. I'll bet you there's not an individual, no matter how ticked off you are, what's going on, that in this room it's not an environmentalist. You know, you can get mad, you go down and start a forest fire, burn down the forest. <laughs> you know, take a 50-gallon drum of oil and dump it in the river and kill everything. You know, that's not happening. Miners, just like any other citizen, we're all concerned about the environment and protecting it and keeping it healthy for our children. And I think even more so the mining community because we want to be out in that environment. We don't want to be trapped in the city, so that is why we would protect it more than most. Many of us will make our livelihoods out there, so you're not going to destroy it. And some of you would very well know that when you're out there in season, of course, you might be fishing for dinner. So that's a very important point that these radicals have hijacked the worthy cause of environmentalism right. because they know that so many city dwellers in the community at large is con concerned about protecting it. So if you can grab onto something like that and twist it and move it around, it's a very, very powerful tool for them to have. And in conclusion, Agenda 21 is evil. <laughs> Some of the last comments I was reading there are from Eco Tyranny's book by Brian Sussman. So some of you down here in this area would know him because he has a radio talk show. It's a great book if you want to just get the really <coughs> easy overview of what's going on. Okay, that, that concludes my presentation. All right, who's hungry? We got pizza in the back there, so I think we'll take a short uh, 15, 20 minute break and uh, get some pizza and uh, we'll come right back to it with uh, hopefully some solutions. So